Here's something really funny. A lot of what I taught way back in the 90s is now being scientifically proven to be true. This whole idea that you can prime people with certain kinds of communication so that they're emotionally ready to receive and to do the behaviors that you want them to do has been shown to be true over and over and over again. And I saw something, I can't pull it up, that says sexual innuendo is actually picked up on the unconscious level if you deliver it properly. I don't remember when the study was done, but it was quite recent. So all the stuff I've been teaching about below me and new direction done in the right context actually does work. <laughs> Ice is already laughing. So yeah, I'm excited to have this conversation. I was very impressed with you, Michael, when uh, uh -huh. we had a discussion with the coaches, I thought you were someone who is worthy of, of taking a deep dive into this stuff. There won't be any controversy here today, ladies and gentlemen. It'll be people complimenting each other's work and discoveries. So this is a John Mulville free zone and also a Michael Sartain <laughs> zone free. Fucker. <laughs> How that fucker punching the balls for taking out of context uh, some shit I did and scorning me behind my back. You tell him I said so, Ice. Wait, what happened? <laughs> I'll talk to you another time. It's not worth disgracing this conversation with it. Yeah, all right. I know you got lots of good shit to unleash, so let's get okay. this started. Um, all right, we're back with uh, Russ Jeffries and Michael Lee, who were in the previous panel, uh, the Dating Coach panel. And there were some uh, good responses to what was being said um, during the first hour or so of the last dating coach panel. So we're back to kind of dive into that a bit more um, because it's not quite gone into in this industry. And well, effectively, I suppose we're talking about the more scientific side of seduction. Um, so of course, People know Ross for his work on NLP, but we also have Michael Lee here um, in interpersonal communication. Uh, so let's dive straight into that. Um, yeah, where <laughs> I don't even know what to ask, but anything you guys want to say in terms of the importance of okay, so this side of seduction? So sure. if I will start here, I think that when it comes to attraction, we have to look at what elements that actually trigger attraction. And we know from the science that men and women work differently. So if we are going to look at from the both sides of what attraction actually is, it's basically neuroscience. We're now talking about releases of neurotransmitters that is associated with attraction, sexual attraction, bonding and love itself. And uh, when we look at the area of interpersonal communication, we can actually see what in interactions that actually triggers those neurotransmitters that leads to attraction and sexual attraction. So when we look at men and women, for example, we can definitely see that men get triggered in terms of sexual attraction very differently from women. So there is a lot of studies made in the world. I mean, University of California, Berkeley College was one of them, University of Montreal, McGill University, and several others have done a lot of uh, research using a functional MRI, basically a neural imaging to see how brains react. And what they saw was that when men was looking at beautiful women, they got an instant spike of neurotransmitters such as dopamine, endorphins, serotonin, and oxytocin. And those are linked to sexual attraction and bonding. And that was significantly strong attraction. They did the same thing with women, where they measured their neurotransmitters release when they saw handsome men, men with status, men with wealth, and so on. And guess what? The neurotransmitters releases wasn't much at all. A small dose of dopamine, they indicate that they might be interested to know more about a specific guy, not more than that. So what does that tell us? 
Well, for starters, there must be more things that triggers attraction in women than purely passive value, such as looks, money, and status. And that is when we go into another study made by Harvard University and other leading communication faculties. What they saw was that when women were talking in depth about what they think about things and about themselves to someone who listen, the same neurotransmitters was released that was linked to sexual attraction, attraction and bonding, but in the smaller doses, but still significantly, but they were holding over time. So the conclusion I can draw with these studies is that in order to really evoke the emotions of attractions in women, we should make them talk as us, as true listeners. And the conclusion made by leading neuroscientists and behavioral scientists was that there were basically nothing that made women feel better than talking about themselves and what to think about things to someone who listen. It doesn't matter if they went to a dream vacation or they did their absolute favorite activity. Nothing was close to the release of neurotransmitters when they were talking in depth. So I find that very fascinating. And that made me focus on that particular area. And now we're going into the hardcore of behavioral science and communication. And interpersonal communication has been very studied since 1950s. A lot of scientific research has been made uh, and the right type of scientific method has been applied. So we can definitely see that this is real scientific data. So the only thing we have to do is to make it practical, which we are going to talk about later on. Uh, massive coincidence here, but just yesterday yeah. I um, scheduled a, uh, an interview with a professor of, and you mentioned the university, McGill University in Montreal. Uh, one of the professors, a, a doctor, um, yep. did a study on the seduction community and from a mental health angle though, um on how the seduction community affects people's mental health so now that i think about it, that's very relevant to uh the expertise of both of you guys um that interview is happening i think in the next one or two weeks would there be any questions you guys would love to ask the professor who was literally given a grant by the canadian government to do this research on the pickup community. Like how, how awesome was that? The study was conducted in 2017 and 2018 and released in 2020. It has no validity because they didn't interview me. So fuck them. Let me explain <laughs> some of uh, Michael's points. One of, one of the things I, I wanna say that in NLP we're very careful when we use what is known as nominalizations, a process verb and you turn it into a noun or a thing. So I would say there's no such thing as attraction. That doesn't mean people don't have the experience of feeling attracted, but to describe it as a thing called attraction can create some confusion. That's the first thing. I understand what he's talking about, but we want to be careful with our terminology. It's just like saying confidence. I want more confidence with women. Well, confidence isn't a thing. It's a neurological state that takes place in the body with a certain amount of neurotransmitters and different feelings in the musculature, et cetera, et cetera. So we want to be careful about that. That's the first thing. The second thing is he's made an excellent point, getting women talking. But in my system, speed seduction, we want to get women talking about certain themes, certain subjects. So my hypothesis, my theory, which I think is, and anything I present is only a model. It's not science. I think they're now starting to show parallels between what I've been teaching for over 30 years and the science. My model says, if you want to get a woman talking, make sure she talks about certain things. Don't get her talking about factual based things like where she went on vacation, but get her to describe what the water felt like, um, what was her favorite part of it? What did she see that excited her most? 
What did she indulge in that really made her think to herself, I want more of this? Gesture to yourself when you say, I want more of this. Activate the part of her mind that's linked to her imagination, her fantasies, her desires. I always tell my male students, there are three big mistakes you can make in a conversation with women. The first one is to talk about yourself. That's why I don't like misery method and all these DHV stories, because you're talking about yourself. The second thing is don't hold fact-based conversations. Rather than asking a woman, a woman, what does she like to do for fun? I like to use this question. When you want to do something that makes you feel totally alive and get your heart beating hard, really hard, and time flies by, what do you love to do? Or even more important, Debbie, what's something you've always dreamed of doing, fantasized about doing, but haven't had the courage to let yourself do this? Now, as Michael might understand, that's going to trigger a different set of neurochemicals, a different flood of things in the brain, and also different responses in the body. Uh, nipples getting erect, uh, but vaginas lubricating, and then talking about facts. So yes, <clears throat> I agree. Get a woman talking about herself. Absolutely true. And make sure she's not talking about fact-based things, but about themes that turn her on, like connection, desire, surrender, indulgence, those sort of things. Can you formulate these questions in a way where it seems like a normal, ordinary, non-threatening, comfortable conversation? That's that's the real art. So everything he says is true. I, I just want to take it a step further and say, there's a way to structure those so you're avoiding fact-based conversations. I have actually came across that during my studies uh, in in interpersonal communication they more or less came from NLP I think and they when we go into meta models in NLP yeah. they yeah. go into what you're talking about now it's not only about the fact based but why is that so it's like getting into the why and I believe that many times when we're talking about asking questions there are different set of questions most of the people, and I mean the vast majority of people, get stuck with the first level of questions that doesn't take things on depth. It's more about what you're doing and what you're liking, but it's never the underlying reason why they're liking it and why they're doing what they're doing. So that is like the, the, the specified questions that actually take things to depth. Once we are in the depth, we now go into the Im imaginary thought as well. If you could change something, then make that better. What would that be? If you could change something in your life, in the course of your life, what would that be? And how would, would you like to change if you could see yourself in, in the future and so on? So we, we actually evoke those emotions where conversation actually matters. It doesn't matter on the first level. It's more like an invitation to conversations. It's more about those specified and deep questions that make something happen. And that is what we used to call the relationship the woman has with things, or people in general. What is the relationship to what that person is doing? It's not until that point where they actually start talking in the way that triggers never transmitters. Asking you about what are you doing for work, and you're saying, oh, I'm a, I'm a communicator. Okay, that's cool. And uh, what do you love to do for fun? Well, I like to go to cinema. Oh, that's also cool. I mean, that doesn't take things for depth. That is just invitation for conversations. But that's one of the biggest part. When you ask a question to someone to invite a conversation, you shouldn't ask another question on this in the same level. You should actually explore what that answer is based on the first question. So we go into the why's and how. That is so important. Otherwise, the whole conversation becomes meaningless. You probably heard about a lot of guys asking question of the question of the question, but it is on this. Yeah, it feels like the interrogation and it just stick on the surface, which doesn't give any influence at all. So, what makes influence based on questions and answers? Well, it is if you actually go into the area of empathy. If you inject empathy in the conversation. You would take things in depth quite quickly because you want to understand how that person are thinking and seeing based on that person's shoes, being in that person's shoes. And what does that give you? It gives you 
information to evolve. I so example, say, if you, yeah. hmm, go ahead. If I could, I think what's, uh, I think what's more useful is curiosity is to mm -hmm. two things. If you're going to do this, you have to set your sexual agenda to one side. None of this is possible if you're in a state of mind where you're vibrating behind your zipper and your mind is going, I want to fuck her, I want to fuck her, and you're staring at her boobs. You have to create a state of consciousness, a neurology in yourself that's neutral, outward focused, and quiet and very observant and thinking just a little bit faster, not speaking, but thinking a, a, bit, a little bit faster. But I want to challenge this idea of why. I don't like asking why questions. I like asking process questions. Let me give mm. you an example if I could. Let me unpack this. I knew a girl named Jennifer. Jennifer was a smoking hot, strawberry blonde painter. She did chalk paintings on the sidewalk. And so I was having a conversation with her. And rather than ask why she started painting or who her favorite painter was, I said, you know, Jen, I think your work is absolutely extraordinary. And when I meet someone who's really extraordinary at what they, what they do, my question is always not why they do it or how they get started, but what was your recognition? How did you come to realize that painting was your passion? Was it a sudden thing to bolt out of the blue or did you develop it over time? Now that requires a deeper dive and it shows a significantly more intelligent side of me to ask that kind of question. And then the next question I asked her is, I said, that's really amazing. I said, so I've got to ask you one last question, please. I hope you don't mind I'm being so curious. And she said, no, no, this is great. No guy is ever talking about this. I said, how do you know when it's time to start painting? And she went, wow. I put, she went to a little bit of a trance. I could see it. Her pupils dilated. Her lip, lower lip got bigger. And she said, I can feel it. My hands start to vibrate. And I see the vision in my mind. Now, those are very trancy phenomena. I said, really? So when you see hands vibrating, I held up my hands, and you see a vision in your mind of something that just calls to you, that's when it's time to take action, isn't it? And shortly thereafter, Jennifer and I were doing the dirty deed. <laughs> now, the, the fact of the matter is, is I didn't ask her, why do you enjoy painting? I asked about her how. I asked about her process. Mm -hmm. I asked I asked about her process and then I asked her how she discovered how do you know when it's time to start painting which is mm. a completely different level of question in order to answer that she has to alter her consciousness and go to a different level than the factual level I'm always trying to bypass if I could and then I love what you're saying too Michael I always want to bypass the checklist part of her brain that's going mm, guys got to be this height He's got to be this old. He's got to make this. I want to shut that off, turn it off, and get into the part of her mind where she thinks about her passions, her desires, how she creates, not why, but how. And mm. so that's just what I'm going to put on the table. So I just want to add something here. When I said why she's doing things, it's a question for yourself. It's not a question for her. You want to formulate questions to not be generic. So... Uh. So, so that is the wise in, in the field of interpersonal communication, we, we're referring to ourselves. Like, okay, she's doing that, but why is she doing that? You think it for yourself, and then you formulate a question that is not that generic based. And I don't like using the word wise myself. In the field of communication, we know that why is sort of a negative loaded generic word. So we really avoid using the word wise. But that is a very good word for yourself. Like when, when people get lost a little bit in conversations, ask yourself, why is she doing that? And then you're going to formulate your questions based on pure curiosity, pure being interested rather than saying a lot of interesting things. And what you explained to me there now is a classic example of how you should do it communication wise in order to really go into the depth and trigger those never transmitters. Absolutely. What was the number one reason you basically started painting here? What is the number one reason you actually start with that job? What would you say is, is the thing that you're really good at with that particular job? 
What is the particular thing that you could take from that job and use for your own good and so on? That is much more effective questions than asking why. So you ask, what are you doing? Oh, I'm a nurse. Okay, so why did you get into that field? That is so generic. It's better to say like, what is the main factor, the number one factor you actually became a nurse? When I'm thinking about nurse, I think about some people doing career, some people doing it to helping people. What is your number one reason? Once she, whatever comes out of her mouth, you can take that and go even more to depth. Before you became a nurse, what, what were in your mind of how that were going to be? What would you say is the difference between what you thought and how it actually is? And what is it that you actually wanted it to be? Now you start evoking your emotions. Whatever comes from her mouth with you as a listener, being dead quiet is just amazing because that is when people actually getting engaged in conversations. It's not until we go into that depth that we make, that we make those conversations meaningful. One, that's, that's, that also, a, that's a great way to do it. Another way to approach that angle is, is I always think, what is it that I know about this profession? What is it that I know in general about what these people do that is a truth that I can use to create a connection? So with a nurse, one thing I know because I dated one is mm -hmm. she worked 12-hour shifts and mm -hmm. she just had to decompress. So a question I would ask a nurse is, I would say, you know, first of all, thank you for taking such good care of people but I know this is such hard work. What, what do you do to decompress from all of this, to let off steam? Like when you want to do something that makes you feel, and I just lead back to that same, same question. The other thing I want to say is this, no matter how good our questions are at evoking the, the neurochemical, neurological responses, mm -hmm. many people we need to earn the trust, the right, even to ask those questions. And we need to go first. We need to prime the pump by sharing something about us, uh, particularly a vulnerability or a flaw or a foible. Everyone wants to be vulnerable, but they want the other person to go first. So mm -hmm. there's a way to share a particular vulnerability or even to fake like you're vulnerable because I have no shame. But often if I'm doing an approach and I don't even think about an approach, I think I never approach. I'm just extending opportunities to connect with me in fun and powerful ways. I will say something like uh, something along the lines. I'll make them laugh and I'll say, OK, that was really cheesy. But as soon as I saw you here, I thought to myself. She cares deeply about other people, but she doesn't give a fuck what other people think about her. If you don't talk to her for a minute and see if she has a fun sense of humor, you'll kick yourself in the ass for the next six weeks. So I'm being very vulnerable. I'm uh, and sometimes I'll say, so put your head on the chopping block and talk to her. Mm -hmm. I'm being vulnerable by exposing what my intent is. Telling a, a woman <coughs> your intent and showing a willingness to get, uh, to metaphorically have your head chopped off opens up the other person. If you can show, I don't know what the studies show about this. You're the scientist. I'm not. I'm just someone who is not experiment, experientially sees this. If you can display vulnerability, the other person opens up and is far more likely to trust you. What have your studies shown on that? So now we're getting into the area of collaborative communication, or we call dynamic conversations. So human being in general, many times don't want to open up first, whether it's about the things that are pretty vulnerable or things in general. So many times when we want to open up a two ways communication. So when we're talking about open up with two ways communication, sharing is a huge part of it, sharing. So what you did with me now or with the woman, you shared something by opening up first. And, and that is very, very important uh, for the conversation to get going for so many people. Uh, I can give you an example, for example, uh, now you, you more or less make, made an approach with intent, it feels like, that is more sophisticated than just a, a regular approach with intent. But many times when we open up, sharing your point of view first in a pretty short and concise manner 
can definitely make you ready to open up for you as well. Um, when it comes to vulnerability, that is a, such a powerful force because that creates neural entrainment, what we used to call it sometimes. It's like you, you, you're getting synchronized, your neural pattern is getting synchronized. You probably heard about that phenomenon. When you open up that way and you're showing vulnerability, you're actually making a synchronized with your nervous system. Uh, they've shown that in neural imaging or functional MRI that when you're getting into that kind of conversations that shows a lot of vulnerability with you showing vulnerability first, your, your neural pathway is getting synced or your neural activity getting synced. It's, it's just amazing how this is, how it is, how it is. And you probably have seen that, maybe couldn't explain that in, in that type of uh, scientific way, but, but you probably have noticed that something is synchronized here. Have you, Ross? Yes, of course. And my question for you is, does this involve yeah. mirror neurons in any way? I mean, if we're talking about uh, sort of, sort of. I mean, as you already know, in interpersonal communication, when it coming to, to mirroring, labeling, and so on, we used to call it empathy or empathetic tools. And I know that from, from mirroring part of NLP, they're using you know, a lot more comprehensive way in mirror things than what we do in communication. In communication, sometimes we're using mirroring when we basically repeating one to two words of, of a sentence that the other person said to ensure that they understand that we understand them. When we talking about the basic of mirroring, we're not talking about exact movement as the other person do, but we're doing the, the basic stuff such as we're talking in the same speed as do do they do. We're talking yeah. in the same level yeah. as do do. If they're sitting down, we try to sit down as well, but we don't do much more than that. So that has not been so much into the area of interpersonal communication more than what I just tell you. And you probably have seen that also with other figures like Chris Boss and other empathetic teachers. Maybe also Vanessa Van Edwards, your niece, probably also teach mirroring yes. in that sense not so much more than 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 the basic mirroring techniques such as try to to speak as the other person do in terms of volume and speed basically yeah uh here's the interesting thing i, mm -hmm. I there's certain words that women will lean on and these are words that have no specific meaning it's not like uh iphone or water mm -hmm. bottle I'll ask them about something and they have a, 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 they sort of, to use a metaphor, push down on the word. I'll ask them a question. Do you wear your heart on your sleeve or can you hide your emotions? Like, let's say you meet someone and you start to feel this incredible connection. You know, those butterflies right there that can let a person have certain, you know, thoughts. I don't mean play with the puppy thoughts, but thoughts. What's your first recognition on the inside? The first sense you get that lets you know that's happening. And so I'm asking a question. First of all, I'm asking a question that's going, I'm loading it with hypnotic suggestions. Feel this connection, mm -hmm. feel butterflies right there, which is recreating what happens in their neurology anyway when they feel turned on. So I'm sort of jumping ahead of the line. I'm taking a cut mm -hmm. in them. But I listen to the words they say. If they say blah, 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 energy, blah, 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 vibration, blah, 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 connection. I'm going to repeat those words back because I know those words, even though they don't have a meaning that matches mine, have a meaning for them. So I'll say something like, isn't it wonderful when you experience this energy that lets you have this connection? And I'll just repeat the words not all their words, but the words that have a emotional charge on them. And in order to be able to pick those out, you have to be able to, again, have a mind that puts your sexual agenda to one side. But more importantly, you have to take on the belief that anything they offer you is information you can use to create desire, to create connection, and ultimately compliance. All these tools of empathy and scientific communication, ultimately, I'm aiming at compliance. I want them 
to complete this may be a terrible, shocking thing for scientists, but ultimately I want them to comply. And I don't know what that looks like scientifically. I just wanted to throw that out there uh, so I can feel myself to be a little bit twisted. <laughs> Okay, so no, but it actually makes sense, uh, never scientifically, because when you're asking about the butterfly, so it's, it's, it's like you're getting still into the area of the depth, in the area of, when I say butterfly, what comes to your mind exactly, you see? So what you're doing is actually taking one, one keyword, or you, you're using your favorite word of butterfly, and then you listen to, to what that person is expressing themselves in terms of what comes to the mind. Once it's saying specific energetic things and you stop mirroring those word, words, you're actually going to show a certain level of empathy because you're taking that word, you're repeating to them, you're showing that I understand what you, what, what you are saying here. Without with just repeating one word, you're going to, they're going to subconsciously or unconsciously feel like, wow, that guy gets me, he understands yeah. me. If yeah. the, and that what happens then, she are already in a pretty good state of having her releases of neurotransmitters and that is just amazing it going like that she's feeling she's feeling something in terms of the release of neurotransmitters because every time we go into that depth we have seen over and over again from the neural imaging that something is happening here something is happening so if you're talking about butterflies and you're just saying that what comes to your mind you're dead quiet and you start listening to the key keywords energy excitement uh, whatever they come up and then if you're going to link that word with something that could be sexual um, can create sexual tension or something like that you're actually anchoring that sexual tension okay. towards you Correct. and what happened then is um, is that is when you're actually using context to drive things further Correct. so many people that I heard from the pickup artist community is they are taking things out of thin air and trying to make something happen what Correct. you're doing here is the opposite you are taking the context of things you listen to you open up the conversation to open up her mind about something butterflies Correct. can be a very good word you're taking the keywords you're making something out of it and you anchor it back to yourself that is You're actually a smart guy all right, you're a smart That's guy. That's a technique. Are you, sure you're not, are you sure you're not Jewish? Because you're super smart. <laughs> yeah. Here's the thing. Ice, mm -hmm. this puts the lie to the whole mystery method thing that you take seven hours to get a woman into that state where she's ready. You communicate like this. You can do it in like two hours or maybe two and a half or maybe maximum three. You don't need seven hours to create comfort or desire or any of that. Would you agree with that, Michael, that if you do this properly... You can create these states fairly rapidly. You don't need seven hours of time. Uh, I can even I can even tell you this one is uh, what you are what we are talking about now is actually the same field. Might be slightly different methodologies, but it's still with with the same fundamental theoretical base that is scientific backed. When I look at mystery method, I don't even know what kind of triggers or evoking the emotions their system can have because i can't really see that being able to perform a certain routine and using instrumental language can actually evoke real emotions you just can't do that there is nothing that actually can do that unless you are going into the area of of depth and empathy it's very very hard there is no scientific evidence that that, that shows that. But if you're coming from the perspective of not doing anything at all to doing something, yes, maybe a mystery method is better than, than not doing anything. But if you're going from the perspective of doing something, then it's, it's not even comparable. There is no data about showing a lot of passive value and, and uh, trying to fit in, you know, I women's... I think the pre theory, uh, preference of things is no. I think their theory is it's triggering some genetically programmed sexual response because you're showing up with the I with the appearance of being uh what women are genetically programmed to respond to a protector of loved ones a, pro a leader of men uh, I I just don't see any first of all how do you measure genetic response there's no measuring tool with that you can scientifically put in some measuring instrument to show that genes are being triggered in real time associated with language. You can show when a BRAC gene or something else 
is being activated, but you have to do a blood draw for that. And, uh, but my real question is not, does it work, but the, the, this puts the lie to the mystery theory that it takes seven hours of being with a woman to get her comfortable enough and turned on enough to want to get with you. If you do this kind of communication we're sharing, it can be in a matter of two hours or maybe three. That whole theory, there's no science that shows it takes seven hours. This is something I had a big point of contention with. Uh, what's his name? Mystery Eric partner. Uh, um, uh, so partner. actually, um, Eric, Eric Kohlberg, Ablaze. So we are planning a separate debate for that, actually. So uh, Eric wants to take on Playing With Fire, Marcus Wolf, and uh, Veiled Intentions on... Uh, the seven hour rule. So he will defend Mystery's idea of the seven hour rule, and the other guys will um, argue for fast escalation game effectively. I think you should bring on Michael here to say there's no science behind that at all, because uh, you have more credibility than I do. I have a stake in the game as someone who's viewed as a rival of Mystery. I'm not a scientist, you are. You should jump into that game and go, there's no science behind the seven hour rule at all. There's just none. That would be an interesting <laughs> point. Yeah, so just send what me I, a what message. I, what I can say basically. Okay, okay, I, we will do that. So when we when we look at you know how we evolve as human beings as well, I mean now we're talking about uh, neuroplasticity. If you I don't know if you heard about that term. Of course. Of course. Uh, and, and what we can see here now is like if we're looking at structural neuroplasticity. I mean, we are evolving all the time. And we're looking at, uh, at, at the, our prefrontal cortex and how that works. Um, we can definitely see that things that were, that, that were of value back in the days is, has no value today or very little of those values. So, for example, if we're going to talk about uh, the area of psychologists or, or you know the psychology theories psychological theories uh, one of the leading figures is john howard uh, psychologist uh, very, yeah, he also wrote you know like a like a pretty comprehensive book uh, award-winning book and so on but he said that in order to actually connect with women as a first base is to op is to get her to feel a certain amount of safety and trust first without that safety and trust nothing else sinks in really so we have to obtain a certain level of safety and trust which can go really quickly with empathy but he also said that when we're going to look at safety and trust and what it is today it's not like what it was ten thousand years ago when safety and trust that time was you having muscles and a spear to fight off predators her prefrontal cortex that time that is like an update version of how the society is in that current presence, was safe in trust if you can protect her with, with your spear, providing food and so on. But today, we're not talking about that type of protection, that type of safety and trust. We're now talking much more about emotional safety and trust. So that has nothing to do with the genetic part at all. So Put safety and trust- the argument and let him destroy uh blaze let him just rip into pieces with the uh, and with the science i i, I want to be there just to shut up and watch <laughs> <laughs> but the, but the funny th thing is like this this is this is uh i mean the scientific papers here is super clear there's no question about it so when we look at what safety and trust is today well it's much more about emotional safety. How do we create emotional safety and trust, which can go quite fast? Well, there is a saying, we tend to trust people that understand us. And how can we make them feel like we understand them? We're doing it with communication in depth, with empathy in the conversations. I can do it. You know what? Here's a scenario. You also can do it with suggestion. Never underestimate the power of suggestion to evoke emotional states. I'll tell you a way that I've done it before is I've told a story. I've said, you know, Debbie, one of the things that I find so interesting, and by the way, thank you for being for our meeting. It means a lot to me, Debbie, 
is how certain people can affect our sense of time. I know this sounds really highfalutin, but let me unpack this for you because I know that you're the kind of person who's curious about her world. So I'm setting a little bar for her. Have you ever, have you ever had a friend and you just feel comfortable, feel such a bond with this person that you can spend months without seeing them, but as soon as you see uh, he's coming back now. You back? You back? Okay. You I'm just back. Feel everything's everything's good now. Okay. Yeah. You just feel so comfortable, so at ease with this person that even though six months has gone by, as soon as you sit down with them, it's like no time has passed at all. I just have a friend like that named Doug. Now, Doug is a kind of interesting guy. And I want to know about you. Do you have a friend? who you can go out for a whole evening for like five or six hours, but it feels to you like only 90 minutes has gone by. And they'll always, oh yeah. I'll say, how did you first know? What what happened to let you know that this was someone you could really enjoy and trust? And the more they talk about that subject, the more they begin to speak about what it's like for to trust and to feel safe all just anchor it to my self by doing this, or I have my David, I'll just get her talk. First, I prime the pump by talking about it's like to have a friend who you sit down with and you feel so comfortable that six months can go by. And as soon as those, but it's like no time has passed. NLP journey. But I hear a lot of of uh, scientific based interpersonal communication tools that you are using and i, I can that. see why it's working i can see it directly why it's 30 working. years before there yeah. was an fmri i just knew it instinct yeah. i think one way you can evoke those states of trust and safety very carefully by giving suggestions and talking, embedding those suggestions within subjects that women love to talk about, which is love to talk about that pump by bringing it up to get them thinking about it. Then I let them talk about it. And so this is, I'm glad to hear there's neuroscience behind it. And finally people can, who've called me a quack can say, hey, oh, he was right. Let's, Sign up for his AI at chat.speedseduction.ai. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's not, I mean, it's nothing that we, we not the world where we want it to be that way. What are we saying right now? And what I'm saying right now is what you are telling me is basically what I said in the beginning. When you're making her talk in that depth, using her imaginary, imaginary thoughts what comes to her mind and so on that is when those never transmitters is triggered there, there is there is science internet it's not me telling you because i want it to be that way it is like that so every time i feel like you're being successful with women and so on you have quite fast being able to take conversation in depth in the area that matters you get back them to yourself by doing a reflective thing or something just a mirroring many times mirroring the words the specific words you make for her to feel like wow this guy gets me i feel so great being with him i i never feel like that because no one can get her talk in depth no one can so your main advantage is to okay. make you go into depth so quickly what i heard now in the way that you're actually asking questions is no doubt that you know how to get into depth so quickly uh, really really quick and once you get into that depth quickly and she still stay there and actually want to tell you what she think about that particular area what her mind is based on what you want to know about her i mean it's just pure goal uh, in terms of sexual feelings attraction bonding and so on basically falling in love i want to 
point out to you, Ice, and Michael yeah, will back me up. It's also demonstrating an emotional intelligence. Uh, mm -hmm. Emotional intelligence is something that I think is magnetic and that is attractive, particularly amongst men, because so few men have it, or at least have the, or, or if they have it, it's taught how to use it. So a man who's emotionally intelligent is a man who's seen as rare and anything that's seen as rare is automatically assigned that's high value if you want to demonstrate high value demonstrate that you have emotional intelligence that's high value that's measurably high value so okay. so michael i'm curious about something and this mm -hmm. is not me a routine on you you're obviously a super intelligent human being <laughs> um, I, you are you are have you found that walking through the world being smarter than the average bear, the, like we say about Yogi Bear, the cartoon character, have you found that the advantages of it have outweighed the emotional challenges of it? Or have the emotional challenges of people being envious or feeling inferior been more difficult than the advantages to you? Well... <laughs> What I've, what I've noticed, my way of seeing the world, basically, is that people are trapped in a bubble. Like, everyone stays on the surface. They are, like, sleeping in some way. And people cannot put themselves in the position of discovery, where we actually start knowing how things actually is below the surface. And, and that made me feel, I don't want to, you know, go and, and feel like I'm a superior in any, in any sense. I, I, I gave up and I don't think about that idea. But what I do know and feel, and it comes to the top professional as well, is that they, they don't know much about other people. They don't know much about how the world actually is. I mean, the map is... Yeah, it's not the territory. That was it's not the territory. <laughs> I still remember that, and and uh, it's actually hold true to a certain extent because people assume to know how other people think and feel, but they don't. They don't know anything about it, and it's not until we ask about it and can put conversation into a certain depth where we can actually find out how things really are. So when I'm walking around. I, I can sometimes be afraid that how shallow the world actually is, how much on the surface people actually are, and specifically when it comes to men, because the unbalanced. Women can evoke the feelings of attraction, sexual attraction, love and bonding instantly by their look. Men can mm. only evoke the same feelings by going into the area of empathy where we actually trigger certain emotions when she's talking about things. <laughs> no, but seriously. Yeah. This book, this book, and this book, which I published in 1988, this is one is 1989. I said, I can't remember the chapter, for men, for women getting laid is a choice. For men getting laid is a chore. On some scientific terms, but it tickles me pink to know that the science is bearing out what I said so very long ago. I think it's self-evident and you're absolutely right. And uh, the other day I was getting coffee and I saw such a strikingly beautiful young woman. She had to be like 19, 20, 22 yeah. tops. Perfectly symmetrical, blonde hair, stunning blue eyes, like cobalt blue, blue eyes. And I felt my DNA saying mate with her, stab her and stab her and stab her. <laughs> and mate with her. Now, I can't mate with anyone because I've had a vasectomy. But that power of that young woman, I'm sure she knows it. She just struck me as someone who's raised by her parents to be humble. Like, now, beauty is common, dear. Don't get a big head. But the power of young, beautiful, attractive women to get men all hot and bothered. Wars have been fought. People, guys will break their backs and break the law to make enough money to get hot women that it's crazy the power of beautiful young women to trigger this is insane and that has not changed absolutely true it hasn't changed at all 
Uh, and one of the sad point I feel for men is that in order to match her attractivity, because men get spared by the beauty instantly. And how can we match that towards us? The only real signs I've seen, both theoretically, but also practically, is actually when we are using the right method in communication that build up the attraction she have for you over time. And when I mean with over time, it doesn't mean it takes very long time, but you're going to build up the attraction in the interaction. It's not what she's going to see you and then feel like, oh, he belonged to my preferences. So I like him now in the same way as he likes me. It doesn't work like that at all. Passive value traits, money status, and so on, has actually quite little value in real, in real attraction. Um, I've seen so many guys really focus on their passive value trait. Like, I have to be really successful, I have to look really good, I have to, you know, have a good status in this, and then be real in conversation with that woman that is just an average dude. Average work, average look, and and, and just the average man, he know how to create um, attractive conversations that make her feel really good with passively or high status guy away like nothing. And that is basically true. Necessity. It's like, if you don't shower or bathe, if you, I used to say in my seminars, if you smell like a if you smell so bad, you'd knock a buzzard off a shit wagon, then I can't whiners into winners. So get out of my seminar room, take a shower and come back down when you smell like a decent human being. <laughs> there are some things that go, oh, scent goes right to the olfactory bulb. There's no routing around that. If you smell awful, uh, you're, you're just not going to get anywhere. Yeah. yeah. Hygiene is, is, is has you know, is very important. So what we are talking about here, we're not talking about the homeless dude living on the street here either. We're talking about a pretty, you know, reasonable looking, decent looking, pretty much average, but with high hygiene. If he can make you feel good in interactions, he will have a huge advantage over most guys out there that don't have. Who recruited all these women to kill for him. And he had like 30 women who just, believed he was God. Do you know anything about Charles Manson? A little bit, a little bit. Yeah, um, no, he was a scuzzy, yeah. pimp, uh, convicted forger, petty criminal. He used a lot of brainwashing techniques and LSD and the rest of it to get these women's loyalty and and to convince them that he was the Messiah. Obviously, we can't do that. Don't want. I think this is so, so putting the lie to what guys have been guys have been taught and told, and the, absolutely amazing. Ice, it's too bad that you can't jump in here with your thoughts. What if we were silent for a minute and gave you time to respond? Because I know there's a delay in your sound. Into that depth, that is true. To oh have my God, that was people. in terms of neurotransmitters. Ice, you've been missing some great yeah. stuff. When is this debate defending the seven-hour rule and ripping uh, it to pieces? Um, we're we're still deciding on the date, but I think it's supposed to be fifteen. I need to double check, uh, uh, but it says here it could be fifteen. The fifteen? Yeah, seven days from now. If I'm available, I want to jump in, and Michael, you should jump in. We should just tag team him, just double team him, and pound on him with the science and the NLP, and just tear that poor fucker to pieces. Ice, yeah, are, are we okay being on? Yeah, of course. <laughs> Michael, <laughs> let's do that. Ross. Join me as my tag team partner. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm. I'm all in for that. I'm all in for that. Ice? So, um, yep. Let him ice, let him know. I have about 15 minutes more than I need my old man nap than I have work I've got to do. Mm -hmm. So um, when we come, when it comes to like the methodology to actually use here, 
my philosophy is to actually take strong fundamental base theoretically from the communication, behavioral science, psychology, psychology faculties, take those theories and make it practical methods. And while creating a system is a very strong intellectual exercise to create something like that, practicing, practicing it is actually much more of a practical exercise than an intellectual exercise. You don't have to reinvent the wheel, so to speak. So for so many guys out there, they can actually learn the real method that is rooted to the real scientific research, actually learn how to start getting into the areas that actually attracts women instead of focusing on wrong things. So there is a saying, like, it's quite cool for you to, to do a lot of cool things. I mean, you can, you can, you can go into the whole self-improvement area and really do a lot of good things for you. You can travel around the world doing a lot of interesting things. But it doesn't really work so much to tell other people about it and make them like you more. It doesn't work that way, including women. And that is a big misconception that so many people have. When I see people thinking that their passive value traits actually trigger the women they want and now they see it because they, they are now rich and they now dressing in a certain way, they are now looking in a certain way. I can say directly that his confidence level and the way he goes about it probably attracts women that doesn't belong to the, to the rule. Is more about the exception of the rule. If you want to go and really attract women, including those that are very, very attractive and have a lot of male attention, and go with the rule, absolutely empathy is the way. What everything that I said in this podcast is actually the rule itself when it comes to female attraction. I'm not going to look for the exception of the rule. I'm going to go itself. And this is what science has shown. And you gave us a lot of good examples of how to take conversation into depth, where we actually triggers those never transmitters that is linked to attraction, sexual attraction, bonding, and falling in love. That is what it is. When she is in that state, of course she will be open to a lot of other things with you. But if you can't get her into that state, I mean, it's a lot harder. It's a lot harder. And when I look at mystery method, for example, or we're looking at passive value trade guy like Mark Michael Sartain, I was that was was part of the the last podcast we had in the in the panel. They are for sure using methodologies that might attract the exception of the rule, but there's no scientific evidence whatsoever that that part will attract women as a rule. I'll also what do you say about it? I'll also say this. I, I he can quote all the testimonials he wants. A guy who's got a twelve hour a day career as a lawyer who's living in junk spot junk spot Idaho is not going to be able to put on a bikini contest without damaging his career. Uh, <laughs> and it's 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 showing no balls. It's just showing no confidence. It's showing no willingness to put your your head on the chopping block to use a metaphor to do that. It's avoiding developing the confidence to go out there, put your ass on the line, lean into any, I don't believe in rejection, but lean into any response that you don't want to hear. It's, it's just pussy stuff. And yes, Michael Sartain, I'm calling you a pussy and uh, shame on you for attacking me behind my back and mischaracterizing with scorn what I actually communicated to that Jew-hating Nazi bastard. Uh, uh, I won't even mention his name. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to bring a little scorn into this uh, sci otherwise scientific uh, discussion, because if I didn't, I wouldn't be me. <laughs> I need to wrap this up in five minutes, because I, I am have a writing deadline. This has been an honor to be on here with someone who's so intelligent. And he's providing the science that shows that my stuff works. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, from from, the, from uh, now we're going to talk about you. So from from uh, a behavioral scientist standpoint in communication, what I can see is that many times when you're talking with women and from an observer like me, it looks like you and her are talking about her. And that is what real powerful conversations do. 
you are when you are talking is mostly of you and her talking about her and that is unbelievable power thing to do then every communicator in the world can definitely see that wow that guy means business he know what he's doing and specifically how you tailor your questions to get into that depth when she's talking and all the never transmitted is spiky to the roof of course you're going to be successful with women because you're going directly into her attraction centra those those elements that creates attraction sexual feelings so on you go straight into that and with 30 years of experience you know exactly how to get there fast and that's why that's you have why called, that's why it's called speed seduction yeah because i don't have time to, uh, and the other thing i i had another thought and it almost flew out of my mind but i'm not going to let it fly out of my mind the other thought i had is how oh, it did fly out of my mind god damn it see that's what happens when you're getting a little older <laughs> oh oh i know what i was going to say you cannot do speed seduction to be stupid you have to be extra smart to be able to uh, don't you think michael to be to learn to communicate in this way you have to be willing to be genuinely curious and to be genuinely curious relies on being more than average intelligence someone who's dull or uh, average is maybe can do this, but they're not going to have a significantly high level of success as someone who's more than average intelligence. It takes brains to do this stuff. Uh, and Absolutely, I'm, guessing, yeah. I'm guessing your IQ has got to be 160 at least. I don't know. If, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the compliment. Yeah, but it is. Uh, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. But it is. You're absolutely it's right. Not. You're absolutely right. <laughs> is it? No. Yeah. So, so just, just to, to add to it, yeah, I mean, in order to be able to, to listen and to hear things, to hear the keywords, you have to be absolutely genuinely curious toward the other person. And that involves you not being self-aware that much. You have to shift your focus completely towards the other person. And you're going to listen to understand rather than listen to respond. You're going to listen to understand so that is one of the key elements for intelligent people to do in conversations to actually make an impact. Uh, if people they are not used to, it, they can't listen. And without the listening skills that requires a strong intent to learn, you cannot, it's nothing you get born with most of so As a rule, no one is born with it. You have to learn listening skills with strong intent. Otherwise you will not create the habituation process to make it natural. You have it natural, I can feel it directly. You hear the keywords and, and you might use the keywords slightly different than what I'm using it, but you hear the keywords, you do something with it. You are taking the context and do something about it. That is your type of methodology. You hear what you're saying, they don't get away with you. So you can, your mindset is like this. I don't care which guy you have met in your entire life. But with me, you don't get away. I hear everything you say, <laughs> and, right. and, and I'm going to stop you here. When you say that, what comes to your mind? Tell me a little bit more about your thoughts about this yeah, part. What's your favorite part about that? Exactly. Absolutely. And that requires listening skills that no one has stole, unless they're really trained. I stole one from Vanessa. Vanessa says, don't yeah. ask people what they, how they, what they do for a living. Say, what does it take? to be good at what you do? That's a much better mm -hmm. question. So props to my niece. Uh, everyone yeah. knows my niece. She's far more famous than I am. I may be a legend, but she's a superstar. I can go, but please keep right. me in that panel because Michael, let's gang up on him. Let's give him hell. Yeah, we. it was very valuable. And I hope that, that all, because we're giving them hope as well. I mean, so many people think that they have to be so interesting and say a lot of interesting things to attract women. That gives a lot of men a lot of pressure. And it's a faulty thing. That is not what the science is saying. The science is saying that in order to be interesting towards women, you have to be interested towards them. You have to show them your pure, genuine curiosity towards them. There's no question about it. So, yeah. Let's finish, finish, finish this up with, with, with that statement. Yeah, and let's finish off these frauds once and for all. Uh, all right, send me an invite. I got to go. All right. Thank, an honor. You. Thank, Thank you so much for hosting us.
Thanks for okay. coming along. Um, my connection has been completely All right, I saw you. terrible. Oh, you still there? Uh, well, that was pretty intensive. I, I see. Even my uh, my audio seems to be coming out super slow to the others. I hope you call. get the recordings. You think so? I think we lost uh, about ten minutes of footage because my connection was so bad. Um, but hopefully, for for but the guys you, watching, you that the, kind of makes like sense. So it's it's like weird for me right now because sometimes I'm speaking and then someone else is speaking, but they don't hear me speaking in the moment that it's happening because my connection is so bad. But um, hopefully, the guys watching this, hopefully that makes sense when I put it together. Uh, I would be fascinated to know your comments, uh, especially because this has been a bit painful with the connection, but hopefully this video kind of makes sense. Um, yeah, I suppose that's all I can say. I think we lost about 10 minutes of footage there, but hopefully it's it's good enough.